sir, now. I'm doing that. Greetings and salutations, and uh, thank you ever so much. Um, I see we've got our princess, Zed Ntuli, uh, amongst ourselves. Um, I tried to give another two minutes or so, so that those that need to join can uh, court us while we're still uh, preparing ourselves to start this uh, conversation. Um, but in any way, um, the decision here is that let's uh, let's carry on. Those that uh, will uh, join will join and, and find us already have started the conversation. Um, my name is Budisipe. I am the chairman of uh, SALJAC, South African Leadership Gentlemen's Club. Um, and thank you ever so much for coming through to uh, engage with us on uh, this uh, Sunday afternoon that also you find it uh, prudent and uh, uh, affording that uh, you, 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 you join us this afternoon. South African Leadership Gentlemen's Club, it is a organization, it's an NPO organization, non-profiting organization that was established in 2019 on the 6th of October in Hammanskral, um, where uh, we, we saw a need that as men, we need to have a space where we can um, enlighten ourselves and, and empower ourselves. The, the organization's vision and mission is purely sitting with the empowerment towards a man and boy child. And this is to respond to the ill or the social ills that we are seeing in our country where men uh, are violating other genders and where men are also uh, not taking, or at least uh, given the privilege to be also heard from their uh, own self or own side of things. South African Leadership Gentlemen's Club is uh, uh, an organization that is driven from the five uh, pillars that uh, governs uh, what uh, we are all about. The five pillars in a brief one, uh, the pillar one, it is uh, about mental liberation. Uh, that mental liberation is talking to this kind of engagement where we are talking as men or talking as a, a team to enlighten yourself or to enlighten up each other and be in a space where we've got information. Hands are better off in understanding some of the things and what is happening around us. And the second uh, pillar talks to the protection of uh, uh, those that are vulnerable and also to respect self and respect those that we live amongst. Uh, these uh, we're talking respect to the women, respect to the children, respect to the elders, as well as uh, protecting them and uh, not uh, bringing any harm. Third pillar talks to the uh, utilization or at least having a rela relationship with uh, uh, the resources that we have. We're talking here money, we're also talking here uh, land where we are saying, in terms of uh, the resources that we've got, if you've got a land, uh, do know how to use it. You don't have to wait uh, uh, to be told how to use uh, a land. You can plant some gardens in your, some vegetables in your yard so that at least you can have self sustenance. We know these are tough times. When we talk about money, we are saying, uh, let us uh, move away from the illness of uh, already wanting to be consumers of uh, the hardship money that we've already uh, worked for over the month. And we are quick to be seen as uh, spending and splashing our money recklessly so that at least uh, it becomes a cyclic behavior. We try to come into that space to say it is uh, uh, of importance that uh, we find ourselves wanting to do the things right. So that is the relationship that we're talking about when we say a relationship with uh, the resources. Um, the fourth uh, 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 pillar talks, it talks to the engagement or at least uh, uh, having taken those resources that I earlier spoke about and uh, fortify our local economies. We, we're talking about uh, empowering those that we know have got businesses amongst ourselves, that they also can be seen to be supported and uh, where uh, they then inevitably 
put back into the communities that supports them. So we, we, we are strongly uh, 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 supporting uh, uh, those that are that we living among our locals. We are supporting the products that are being done or at least manufactured in South Africa. And we encourage our members to do so. The fifth and the last pillar talks to the necessity to engage and bring in the youth of this country and uh, try to bring some sense into uh, making them not to be kids who are just wandering this, around the street. We say through the boy child program, through mentoring as child Saljek, we need to be seen uh, working closely with our youth. By the way, a country that does not uh, look after its youth is a doomed country. It's, it's simply uh, justified to say we do not have future if uh, we are not going to be looking after our youth. So um, Saljek is more into uh, wanting to work closely with our youth to guide them so that at least we have a better future lined up for the leadership that we want to see in the future. It also talks to this pillar, talks to the advantages that we want to take in terms of uh, the changes in technology, the changes in what they call for IIR, uh, industrial revolution, to say we need to move with the times, hence uh, this opportunity to also make this uh, engagement on a platform such as Zoom, so that those that can uh, 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 want to join are far from ourselves uh, having to meet in a community hall, not that uh, it's the wrong thing, but far from that particular community hall, if we were to hold this meeting, that they are also are able to connect through the kind of Zooms, the kind of Teams, and the many other platforms that we know on the social media that it can enable us, as well as the other tools that can enable us to be a better organization. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a brief uh, uh, introduction of who South African Leadership Gentlemen's Club is. Let me then take the opportunity to introduce our speaker, our guest uh, this uh, afternoon. This is Ndate Mbodi, uh, Inos Mbodi. Ndate Inos Mbodi is the National Secretary of NUMSA in uh, Excom. He works at Excom. He is a Sub-Saharan Energy Network Chairperson. Ndate Mbodi is uh, also a Commissioner in the Presidential Climate Commissioner Commission uh, since 2020 to date. He's, uh, he's been involved and in, uh, trying to make input into those uh, aspects that talks to climate. Ndadem Bodhi also, he's uh, an author. He is also a poet. He is again, a, an artist of uh, a, a noble note that uh, he taps onto all various types of uh, artistry. Uh, I know that uh, he also writes songs and uh, these are the kind of energies and the kind of efforts that in that body goes and uh, 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 um, to fulfill his uh, 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 persona. Let us then uh, 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 take this opportunity and uh, talk to the subject of the day. Uh, maybe let me give you an opportunity in that body after that uh, brief uh, bio, so that if you need to extend anything that uh, before we start, I can uh, then uh, and, uh, put a preamble. That body? I think it all is well. You have summarized it all, all well, and I rather must give uh, back to you so that you do um, the necessary preamble. All right. Thank you ever so much, the body. And uh, so, uh, Last uh, two weeks ago, we had phase one of the, this uh, topic discussion, energy in transition. And we were so excited and are still excited in terms of what was discussed then. We, we, we only tapped into a little bit of uh, what we could uh, at the time of our discussion. We looked uh, into your definition of what uh, energy stands for and uh, the kind of types of energies that uh, we'll be discussing or at least uh, discuss at the time. You did uh, indicate that there's chemical energy, there's radiation energy, there's uh, 
thermal energy, there is electrical energy. And of importance, you indicated uh, uh, how important it is that uh, uh, there should be a regime, or at least there should be a proper regime in every uh, state to have uh, its own uh, uh, you know, certainty as a country. So uh, these are the kind of things that you, 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 you spoke about last time when we, we touched on this. You, you, you went extend to elaborate the difference in those uh, particular types of uh, energies. When we quickly talk about the chemical energy, you spoke about the efficiencies as well as the uh, dependencies that we have around chemical energy, such as petrol, such as paraffin, where uh, the masses of this country are in, indeed uh, affected in terms of what is happening in terms of those energies and the controls that are made around those energies. When we talk about the electrical energy, you came into the space and we spoke about the load shading. And uh, as far as uh, what would have uh, been the decisions as well as uh, the programs that needed to have been established to find us out of uh, the challenges that we currently have, such as load shading. You also uh, touched on uh, things such as tariff increases. Uh, the South African uh, country or this uh, South, Afri South Africa as a country to not really uh, take advantage of its own resources such as coal, its own resources and uh, the kind of manufacturing things that it would have done previously such as Sosol where we manufactured uh, our own petroleum and so forth. And I think because of time we could not uh, elaborate further hands our query and request to you to say, can we then extend this conversation so that at least we can dive deep into this conversation and uh, further and enlighten ourselves uh, more in terms of uh, uh, the discussion. It is then that body my turn to uh, give it back to you, sir, with this uh, 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 preamble, sir. Take over. Thank you so very much and uh, welcome. I mean, I, I, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, there is a wide range of topics that one can um, uh, really go into, but this one, it's really prioritized because of its high importance to every human being living in this country and elsewhere. Just remember first that at some stage we accepted that we are part of the global village. Being part of the global village means you, are, you have got peers all over the world who look at what you do, how you do things, and you can't set your own rules. You need to work in within the rules that the globe sets. I'm not saying those rules become the best rules all the time. They are the rules that can be contested. They are rules that we can look at and say, but how fair and just are these rules? But today I want to start somewhere. I want to start at giving out something that is very, very important. Many of you may not know that at the time when we go through load shedding, from April to now, to date, April of this year to date, did you know that we have banned about 217 million diesel liters, the liters of diesel, because of um, uh, uh, using the diesel turbines, uh, diesel in the turbines to make sure that there is augmentation in the generation capacity of our, of our, of our, it, into our grid. That is a whole lot of diesel to burn. And that is a whole lot of money to burn. I've also told you that we spend quite, we lose quite a lot of opportunity in terms of opportunities in the production of goods and services and in the production in the economy. About 700, yo, it's a lot, 700 million um, per day. It's a lot, it's a lot of money, especially in a country which is still struggling with this and that. 
But I also think it is important to mention that because we are part of the global village, we also look globally at what the statistics says about different forms of energy. And I just want to share before I go into the issues of transition, which are very, very important. And uh, I mean, oil, for instance, let's start with oil for now. At the current rate of use, the whole world has got about 40 years of reserve of oil. Uh, so at the current rate of use, which means as we continue to use in the manner in which we use it, if all doesn't change, the reserves that we have left is about 40 years reserve. When it comes to natural gases, <clears throat> uh, excuse me for that, natural gases at the current use, we've got about 60 years according to the current use. So which means if we use it the same way as we're using it, we are going to have about 60 years left at, as, 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 as the reserves. Coal, at the current rate of use, we have got 200 years at the current rate of use. Yeah, that is a, a long time. Uh, but I want, I want to indicate something which is very important. When we were looking at the sub-Sahara in terms of the energy mix, when we're talking electricity, I did say that there is a part which is played by nuclear. Now, nuclear, we have got, uh, for those of you who do not know, we have got a power station in Cape Town, which is called Quebec. And it happens to be the only one in the sub saharan And um, it can produce large amounts of large scale electricity without increasing the CO2 emission. So if somebody is talking about clean energy, this is clean, it may not be green, but it is clean energy in that we don't have emissions that are going um, uh, uh, to increase. Remember what I said earlier on the other program that we had, I said, even with nuclear waste storage, we are not having a crisis where the nuclear storage uh, is becoming a problem or the space is even, I mean, I said the size of a tennis court, we have not yet even filled a court of that from 1985, if not 87. So uh, indeed in the whole world, you've got 440 power stations, which are nuclear across the globe. I do understand that there are different questions about whether this is safe. But when I looked at the statistics and you can go and look for yourselves, we are not picking up as many um, uh, 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 challenges, safety issues with regards to nuclear. We know that there are many safeguards uh, when it comes to nuclear. There is a lot of regulatory issues on nuclear but it gives us a best chance to make sure that we don't drop down with regards to what is called the base load supply. The base load supply is the basic minimum that we need to run our economy, to light up our homes. And we need that base load without interruption. We need that, that is the basic of what we need. And if we don't have that, the doubt is intermittent supply of electricity uh, coming from solar because the sun shines when it wants and when God permits and the wind blows when it wants and when God permits. And it gives us these renewables, they give us intermittent supply of energy. We can't rule them out because they are part of the energy mix in the country. Um, because in the country we've got energy mix, which includes everything from coal. It also includes uh, renewables. It also includes nuclear. It includes biofuel and all that biomass. But what I want to indicate to you is that every one of the things that are in the energy mix need to be taken and looked at um, in context of our situation in the country. How do we deal with this energy mix? How does it help us? How does it take us forward? 
It doesn't help us to cut, copy, and paste. We can't cut, copy, and paste because when we cut, copy, and paste, we can take the solutions that are working for other people and try to make it work for us. That was so that I may introduce this to the uh, people that were not there the last time around. Now, the global village, because we're part of the global village, has found out that there is climate change is issues. And these climate change issues need to be dealt with urgently. For instance, this past week, we have seen how there were rains that are unnatural during winter. Some of us are taking it light, they call it I e winter It actually means winter is coming to an end. And then others will say, I uh, this rain is just ushering a, 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 a cold front of sorts. But we, we mustn't run away from the fact that climate change is causing a havoc as we would have seen with the floods, as we would have seen of the rains during winter, as we would have seen of the change of patterns. These change of patterns, they begin to even affect food security. That is why when you talk energy, you mustn't talk energy to the exclusion of issues like food security. Why food security? They are droughts that we are not anticipating naturally. They are coming as a result of climate change. Climate change is drying some of the rivers that today um, are useful in order for our people um, uh, to, to feed their, their flocks and to, um, to do their laundry and, and all of that. And, you know, then it also affects, drought also affects what? Water security. And I've already mentioned that drought can cause food shortage and can add to food security uh, challenges and food poverty issues which uh, goes further to increase our poverty level because all these things, they work together for good. You can't simply take away energy, uh, take away food security from climate issues and take away uh, water uh, security issues from climate change. I wanna tell you something that I discovered. The last week I went to East London and when I went into this particular hotel, I could see that written uh, in the restrooms that people should use water sparingly. And something said, you need you know, to go and check what is the reason for that. Their dams or their reservoirs are close to, to 0%, very, very close to disaster they are in the brink of disaster. What is the cause of that? The, the rain patterns, the droughts that are not natural, that which are caused, which uh, are caused by, by climate change has begun to be a big problem in East London. In Port Elizabeth, if you go there, you will see it is something, it is called water rationing. People are now, um, um, water rationing. It's also happening in, in, in Durban. And it's it funny that there were floods. Um, also the issue of poor um, um, design of infrastructure. It's really problematic because you would have imagined that during the floods, they would have been, water would have been captured before it drifted back to the sea because the sea doesn't necessarily run short of water, but the dry land where we are, it needs water. So food security because of droughts, and again, water security because of droughts. But look at it this way. Um, whilst we are dealing with the issues of moving with the globe in addressing climate issues, we need to be careful so that the solutions of the climate change doesn't disadvantage us in so far as energy security is concerned. 
And I know that we can't say energy security, it's more important than food security and water security. And we can not also say air quality challenges, air quality are non-issues. We need to chase energy security and ignore the air quality issues. We can't also say we chase air quality issues um, and avoid water security issues. We can't say water security issues and say we avoid um, uh, food security issues. But all of those are connected to the socioeconomic challenges that we have. Which brings me to another point. The point is, we don't believe that um, climate issues are environmental issues only. They are more than environmental issues. Well, there may be environmental issues, but also social issues. There are also economical issues. There is no country in this world that is not going to suffer if their energy system, their energy regime is compromised and it's not working um, to help industrialize it. And there are some other companies that will tell you, we need energy in such a way that without it, we rather must go somewhere where we get the economic advantage in order to produce what we produce. On the other side, there are companies that produce and they use, they use large quantities of water in their production systems. They get affected when you get to water rationing. You are beginning to talk to them. You are beginning to say, reduce the usage of water or find a way in which water is used sparingly. But what if the systems are such that changing actually means the changing of all the systems, which may not come overnight, which might mean that whatever it is, the decision that the company takes may even lead to the company moving to a place where the water supply is not rationed. So just imagine, you are in a place where there is load shedding, which is happening three times a day for two hours. Two hours is a long time. When you are sitting and you are doing nothing, you begin to think and become creative. What else can be done? Just imagine what happens in the minds of people who are supposed to industrialize or industrial captains. And, and, and see now what the problem is with the whole of these things. When there is water shortage, I have seen that the, the middle class and the other people who can afford, they can go and buy water and buy potable water. And I know that the poorer people in our societies, in our rural areas are still sharing water with, with, with animals. And the animals get to die also because of the drought that is ensuing, uh, that is coming up because of climate change issues. And the ponds are drying, which actually means our people who don't have taps are also at a disadvantage because the rivers are drying up. Now I am saying this so that we can be able to balance. We need energy. We need to deal with climate change issues. But we also need what? We also need what? Food. No society can operate without food. Nobody can go to work and work optimally without food. And the food is cooked and it's cooked by water. And the water is what the climate change is giving us less of. Let me also tell you that South Africa is a water scarce. Um, a society which is also getting water from Lesotho. And so we need to do our level best that would not irritate the people of Lesotho. Because if we do, and when we do, we need to recognize the fact that if we do, that will begin to affect water security in a big way. But also Lesotho is not immune to the challenges of climate change because the challenges of climate change are affecting the whole globe, not only South Africa. Now, why now are we talking about just transition? And, and underline this, I'm not saying just energy transition, I'm saying just transition, because this transition is not only 
about energy. It touches social economics. It touches our lives daily. Let me also indicate something so that we flow together. Just do know that with the transition, there are also projects that are in the thought process of the captains of industries. For instance, there is gonna be an introduction of electric vehicles, which means internal combustion engines are gonna be a thing of the past. But let me start right at the beginning that when you go there, you need to have, the, have electricity so that people may, when you say it's an electric vehicle, there should be charging points. When there should be charging points, there should be energy in the charging points. There should be electricity in the charging points as we, it is now. When we try to move to that direction, the question we must ask ourselves is one, will we have enough energy in order to support that endeavor? Or are we going to dream like the rest of the world, which doesn't have energy issues like South Africa has, which doesn't have electricity capacity issues like South Africa have? Are we going to dream of electric vehicles without uh, uh, the necessary electricity? Are we going to really uh, 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 venture into that space without knowing whether we can be able to sustain that venture. Number two, do we have the skills in the manufacturing side of things now, the skills to manufacture those vehicles? I mean, I was reading a report this week that says there is an acute shortage of skills um, uh, uh, in the EV uh, side um, to promote a steady growth of the EV. What does that mean? I have said we have already youth unemployment at, at its worst stage. The country has got huge amounts of unemployment um, levels. And we are talking poverty. That is, uh, majority of our people are actually living in poverty. Most of the people that are working, they don't have any money to save. They are supporting families across who are not working, who are poverty stricken. So there is no creation of wealth because you have got to save first before you invest. Creation of wealth can't happen in the place where poverty is sucking money uh, from a majority of people who are working today, who don't even have increases that matches the task at hand of feeding these families. Now, now you don't have the skills, what happens? The bosses are not so much worried about whether the skills can come from South Africa or anywhere. But here's the danger. When, when we transit and we move towards a climate resilient economy, we need to have the skills that support that. Supports that which is exactly why it is important to make sure that our ducks are in a row. We mustn't dream too much. When we dream, we need to wake up into a reality of saying, what amount of skills do we need? What amount of reskilling? There are people who are already mechanical engineers. Now we need to think of transforming what they're doing right now uh, because we are moving towards EV. We are no longer going to have internal combustion engines, but we cannot also sleep to the fact that the world is moving towards EV. But when we move, we need to have skills ready. If we don't have the skills ready, what happens? We are going to import the skills. By importing the skills, we'll be taking the money out of the country. But is it not that we should be able to plan this at the speed and pace and the ability of the fiscus, not only of the fiscus, of everybody involved in the country. Now, this is the reason why I say just transition is very, very important uh, because it gives us a chance to have consensus as a country with regards to how we prioritize how we make the speed to adjust to our challenges. Because it is, I posted this on Twitter, I think it is about two or three days ago, 
we had met the president of COP26. COP26 um, uh, uh, or the COP meetings is where each and every year annually for two weeks, uh, the presidents and uh, all the activists, they, they focus their eyes on new developments with regards to climate change issues. And the president of climate change of COP26 was in the country. We were invited. I was invited by uh, the embassy of, of UK. Went there and as we were talking to them, I was the only uh, presidential commissioner in the meeting, the others were secretariat of the support. And uh, by virtue of me being there, I had to, to give a talk about the sensitivities around this transition we're talking about. And I mentioned that there is a danger that South Africa can be an international star who is a national disaster. National disaster because the people who look at us and say, you are running at the speed that is not um, talking to our fiscus, the ability of our fiscus to carry the burden of transition. So transition, it's a movement from where we are to another way the economy needs to run, which is climate resilient. Climate resilient meaning it should consider the challenges of climate. We should look at air quality and say, as we produce air quality, how are we improving it? Or how do we continue to dirtify? Do we continue to make dirty the, 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 the air quality? The movement from where we are to where we are going, it's about an economy that is climate resilient. So what is this EV vehicle? This EV vehicle will make sure that there are no emissions, no exhaust uh, issues. There are no, nothing that will go up into the environment. But the skills and the ability of the fiscals to carry the load of all those things need to be considered. And I'm going to mention three things, a few things, in fact, not three things that are very, very important. Now, somebody can say, but what are the biggest worries of trade unions? And I will also touch on the civil movements. What are the biggest worries of trade unions in, in South Africa and across the globe? I've already told you that I'm a chairperson of the Sub-Sahara Energy Network, which covers um, um, Africa widely, as widely as possible. We have got the same things. Job losses are very, very much a problem for us, not only because we are jealous of the shop floor things, we are also uh, aware that what we work for goes into the society. And what goes into the society actually supports the economy. We spend in the same economy. We spend in the local economy. The total sum of local economies is a combination. In fact, it's a combination of microeconomies uh, at an individual level, at a societal level, and also at a national level, which is very, very important. If you lose one job, you are losing one active person in the economic, uh, what you call activity. Now, job losses are a big worry, not because we just want to work, but because working reduces poverty. It also improves the unemployment. When you are unemployed, unemployed um, you don't have a lot that you can contribute in the economy. The economy is so constraining that if you want to start up something, you need to go to the bank. The bank says, if we give you the money, um, uh, how do we leverage this? How do we leverage this debt that we're going to give to you? So you may have a great mind as an unemployed person, but you will not have an easy access into the economic activity and starting up a business. So you are unemployed, you are unable to get into the business world, then what, what happens? Number two, the issues of skills, you must look at the sector, the, the, 
the sitters to see if they are really moving at the pace at which we are selling this country's, this country's desires to, to stop um, uh, the deterioration of climate. We, we make promises to them and we, 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 we commit to a speed of a certain sort. When we do that, are we considering the fact that people, the jobs must, must, must be retained? Are we considering the skill levels? Do we have the skills that takes us into the next other way that we produce other than the way in which we produce now, which may be a fossil intensive? The other thing is, I mean, when, I mean, reskilling and upskilling and all that, it helps in making sure that we continue to exist in the job market. Otherwise, some skills that we have right now, when we move over to an economy that is economy, that is climate resilient, are going to be redundant. So it, we, we may not be able to use them because they may not be of use. I was talking to you the other time and I said, I'm yet to see anybody who says, I work in a company that manufactures coal stoves. So in, 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 in that way, electric vehicles are going to re re replace the cars that we drive today. The people that we have who are having skills in the townships and even I mean, in the informal sector and also people in the formal sector will be redundant when that changes. We need therefore to move uh, at the pace at which we can say the skills are ready. We can say the skills are ready and we are moving at the pace we can afford. We are not taking up a lot of debt in order to please the international world when we become a disasters nationally. Now, what is important now with the issue with what is called just transition. Just transition, it's about justice. When you are moving over, the justice has to cover three important aspects. And I want to talk to, to them today. I will not have done justice if I don't talk to this. They are principles that we need to consider when we are talking of just transition. Just, it's about justice. Just, it's about justice and fairness. You know, there is an aspect of justice called distributive justice. I touched on it uh, on the 12th. I want to go a little deeper with regards to this. Distributive justice actually means that the opportunities and the risks must be distributed fairly across cognizant of gender. Now, let me talk a little bit about gender. I've already indicated that in the good olden days, we used to have women, not in the good olden days, because even now in rural areas, people are still cutting woods, deforesting, cutting wood in order to warm up their houses to build fire by which to cook and whatnot. And if you are spreading any opportunities and risks, you must be con considerate of the fact that the rural women are already carrying a huge amount of risk we need to take away from them. I've indicated what happens to them when they go to cut the wood, they even get raped, they go through a whole lot that a woman in the city doesn't go through. So as and when one is worried about cooking food here in the cities, Somebody's worried about the wood that can cook that food. If the wood is there, if the wood is wet, what actually happens? Now we need to look at the distribution of opportunities and the risks equitably, which means we don't have to have other people getting a burden of risks and carrying them as painful as it is and with no one worried about them and others actually suffocating themselves with profit each and every day. So we need to have safeguards. And you, my, my friends who are watching this, who are um, listening to this, 
must be that watchdog. We cannot sit and watch <clears throat> as the rich people begins to be more richer simply because they are on just transition. We need to make sure that the poorest of the poor people is considered in the distribution of opportunities. We cannot leave the poorest people out and always pile all opportunities to the rich and put all the risks to the poor. It is not sustainable at all. Yesterday, I posted something on Facebook and I said, you know, the world knows who is the richest man on earth, but the world may not tell you, cannot pinpoint who is the poorest man on earth. There is no price for guessing why, because I mean, that is how capitalism works. But we must also look at the opportunities and make sure that these opportunities and risks do not go to one race. They need to be spread along the races. South Africa, you know the races that we have. You also know the ownership of the economy, Uguti Ikupi. You know the ownership of land, Uguti Ikupi. Now, when we move from fossil to what is called a climate resilient economy, we mustn't have opportunities going to people who already have opportunities. And we mustn't have these risks going to the race that is always docked to be the last one in the, in the feeding trial. And, and I think it is very, very important. I saw my sister here who is a startup um, businesswoman who is doing business in the petroleum side. As and when there are opportunities, the opportunities should be, consist, co co be um, cognizant of the gender struggles in getting into this male dominated businesses. So there should be a way to make sure that uh, women are considered, but our, the race of our people, when I say our people, I'm speaking to us now. We cannot be watching this transformation happening and we are watchers whilst other people are partaking and they continue to get opportunities. And it's like opportunities go to those that already have opportunities. But these of those of us who don't have opportunities, we always carry the risks and not opportunities because opportunities are not uh, uh, given to us. The issue of income inequalities. Know that when income inequalities also is problematic because it causes for you to have no the problems with the access to the finance market. Um, when you go and want a loan, you can't go and request a loan of a million rand and you don't have one rand. It is very difficult to can go through that because those that have got a million rand, they are able to get a million rand. Now, it actually means the opportunities for those that have got money are better um, and uh, uh, the, the poor remain at a disadvantage. So we need to be equitable in our sharing of opportunities and risks. As it is, I've already told you that the rich are able to put prices, add things to prices and not worry a lot. Let me just take a little bit break and tell you uh, what I have seen when I'm, we're still talking distributive justice. What I've seen, there is an organization of white people that was saying uh, we need to to not have 11% of a road accident levy. And our people are insured using this monies that are connected to, fuel, to, to the fuel that we, we use each and every day. When the petrol price goes up, consider that, that South Africa may not be like other countries that do not charge fuel levy. <laughs> fuel levy and the other countries that charge road accident uh, fund levy. Now this white organization is saying, ah, let's do away with uh, road accident fund levy. And some of you might as well know that that road accident fuel levy uh, costs as much as 11% of the retail price. Now, if you look at the price of petrol right now, you can be able to see what is the price per liter 
without the fuel levy and without the road accident fund levy. The fuel levy is 20% of the retail price. Now, somebody will ask, why do we have prices that are cheaper in other countries uh, that are neighboring countries? You must ask yourself if they have got fuel levy, if they've got uh, uh, these taxes and levies that we have in South Africa. But on the, on the upside of it, this road accident fund has helped quite a lot of accident victims who ordinarily wouldn't have money to deal with them. Um, uh, the after effects of uh, uh, accidents. But when people are very much in short, <laughs> when people are very much in short, they're not worried about that. They said, no, let's cancel that. On the other side, we are saying, oh, the price of, of petroleum is such that um, it causes us to lose economic advantage in the products, products in the industrialization in the, in the country. Other people actually disinvest and go and invest elsewhere because they're saying the prices are high. Cash 22, we need to balance. How do we do away with road accident uh, uh, fund levy? I say no, because the people who are saying that are wrong people. They've got, uh, they are insured in such a way that oh, they can do with um, uh, anything. But the majority of our people, they don't even have the money uh, to can insure themselves at the basic minimum. So I think it is very, very important to see these things. I was talking about distributive justice. So we must be able to have people carrying the overall, but the whole people of South Africa, we need to be able to carry just transition. Its opportunities should be shared with everybody across the classes, across the, the societal divides, and across the genders, across the races, nobody should have any better than the other. And so I think it is important to note that therefore, I've already mentioned that we need to be able to make sure that the skills of South Africans across the board uh, is ready to, to play a, in this just transition as we move to the other side, to the climate resi resilient economy, we need to be ready we need to have had distributive justice, which is the first thing. When we do that, we need to have social policies that are clear with regards to making sure that there's distributive justice. Let me just make an ex example. There should be a way in which we promote, we improve the cap skill capacity. We should have what is called um, when you have closed a local economy because you are moving from this direction to the other, you need to promote local economic development. You can't cancel this one out and have a vacuum. So it is distributive justice is that will force or... all of us. Okay. That will force all of us to have, uh, to promote local economic development. And it is, it is all of us who need to think about what are the social nets that should be there when we move? Some people can talk against the grants. I say grants are very important so that there should be food on the table. Uh, somebody will say, but look, the, task, the, the tax uh, basket is shrinking. But I want to, to, to argue that, be thou as it may, the issues of grants and other social network protection is very social net protection is very, very important in just energy transition. We, it needs to be inclusive. Let's move to restorative justice. Restorative justice means we need to be cognizant of the health challenges. In places like Mpumalanga, where there is both ESCOM and SOSOL, there are also um, air quality issues. There should be a consideration of health uh, challenges. And so special hospitals should be built there. That is restorative. And wherein there are mines that are mining and they are depleted, they should be a restoration of the, the, those, those places. We need to be able to close them up. We need to, that is restorative justice because then the people themselves need not have to um, worry about uh, 
uh, just transition which doesn't have that. It should have that. If anybody is producing anything that affects the water security and the water quality, we need to begin to worry that company needs to invest a lot to make sure that the water quality is it's, 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 it's kept as pure and as clean as it should be. And it is very, very important because other companies, they will tell you that uh, they will uh, make the air dirty and when they're done, uh, they will just rip the profits and not even employ people from the local uh, space. So restorative justice, it's very, very important. We need to create opportunities also. Remember, I've already indicated that the ownership of the economy is in a few hands. Restorative justice also talks of creation of, um, uh, of, of uh, opportunities, not only retaining them, but creation of opportunities. We need to be able to create opportunities for people who are going to lose certain things in the transition. That is restorative justice and air quality needs to be checked. Water quality needs to be checked. Whoever is affecting food security, who has taken land that is arable land, land that can be used to, to make food available, need to be available also to, to give alternative space where the people can go and, 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 and farm. You can't say, I am going to produce this at the expense of food. No, we need to think of restorative uh, uh, justice. And we also need, we cannot run away from broad uh, based black e economic empowerment. Although it has got its downsides, we cannot say because it has been abused and used uh, incorrectly, it shouldn't be part of the deal when we talk restorative justice. And also, I want to talk about now the last one, which is called procedural justice, which leads to a very important question. Do people even know that South Africa has committed itself to move in a very fast pace, to also touch a resource of this country, which is coal, which is giving advantage uh, on the other side? I don't know, some other people will argue and say, but it is part of the challenges of our emission that need to be addressed uh, of coal, yes. But people should not refuse when there are alternatives, um, issues like clean coal technology. People should not refuse to even hear that and just hate the, way, the word coal. We should not have hatred which is sponsored for coal. We should say, are there any technologies? Is there anything that is happening that can give us and continue to, um, um, uh, uh, to energize our economy with coal. Or we will simply say we have got pet aid for coal. No, we should be able to say, are the people aware that even the cost of this transition can affect your, your, your sovereign debt for years to come? Are the people aware of even the definition of just transition? Why do we even need just transition? Are the people involved in so far as these talks? And we're not talking about talking to each other so that we can rush and tick. I'm talking about proper decision making, sitting down, drafting pathways, making sure that the people decide and say, we want this because this is good for us. We want that because that is good for us. We understand that when we move from coal, we are moving the advantage that goes with it. But when we move, this is where the jobs will come from. This is where alternative economic activity will come from. The people should not be told that. The people should design their way forward. That is procedural justice. Procedural justice is to take this problem, these issues to the people and let the people come up with solid input of how people can move from this to that. Now, I am saying this because I have seen a lady here who says she is into the petroleum business. I think right now, now that the move is still being talked about, a person like you need to be in the places where people are talking about energy issues and climate issues.
because they are interrelated. And interrelated as they are, they are socioeconomic um, issues that are politically decided upon. And we are saying procedural justice is to take the debate from the high tables to the lowest of the lowest places where people can be found. And the people themselves can decide what they want. And also all the just transition projects that the people say um, uh, they, they, they think this can be useful in transition. Those should be implemented for those people. I will just make an example. If there is a community that says, we want to have our own renewable energy scheme. And we want to power a school or power a church. They should be support financially and otherwise to make sure that the people are not only involved in talks, that they, they become part of this project. So procedural justice starts with how we come up to solutions. We cannot have scientists coming up with solutions for us. We cannot have foreign governments that are in Europe making decisions for us and our people having to watch with no input whatsoever, no benefit whatsoever, no projects of theirs that are supported. And so that is why procedural justice is very, very important in so far as just transition is concerned. I would have told you earlier on that just transition is not just energy transition. It's a transition that is moving us to a climate resilient economy. The economy that is taking care of its water resources, which is making sure that the water resources in the drought um, that is being caused by, uh, by, uh, by climate change are taken care of. And I am saying there are many people here that are listening and who are watching who know of things that can be done but who also can talk to the powers that be wherever they are to say, look, we cannot have floods and not have catchment area for water. Water cannot go into the sea when the sea doesn't need water and when we need water and we don't have the infrastructure that does catchment. We need to, to, to think clear, clearly about our sewage systems, about our drainage systems to say, but how can we secure the waters? How about we do something that is called water harvesting? Why don't we do that? In some rural areas, there were some Jojo tanks and there is a whole lot of uh, criminal and corrupt activities that has been connected to those Jojo tanks. But water harvesting is very, very important in a water scarce environment like this. But procedural justice will ask you this question. Are people aware of that? Are people part of those decisions? Are people part of the benefits? because you can't just have people being part and other people are part of the benefits. Distributive justice, restorative justice, whoever messes up must pay for the mess up. We also believe that other companies need to pay reparations. You can't go, for instance, I mean, people are saying, we have discovered some gas in, and we need to explore. The people say, yeah, you can explore, but the problem is, we have seen that you have got a history that when you explore, you don't think about us as the society. We smell whatever we, comes from your side. And when we have got breathing issues, you walk away with the profits and we walk away with pain in our chest, with uh, health issues and nobody paying for that health issue that is caused by them. It is obscene to take profit when people are dying because of your actions just simply because you want profit at the expenses of the health of the people. We say there should be restorative justice. We also say there should be distributive justice in so far as making sure that the opportunities are shared equitably. The rich must not be gaining uh, all opportunities and the poor being excluded and just only being included in the risks. I want to end by saying this, energy is very important. You need petroleum right now in order to move your cars to work. Economically, you can't be productive 
uh, without right now we we still need to deliver things right now the trucks still need to deliver things at your pick and pay and Woolworths and they don't drive on water right now they are not driving on electricity right now so right now where we are we need we need petroleum we need petrol we need diesel and we need that at the most affordable um, uh, what you call um, uh, prices so that the rich may not hand us the prices in the prices of their goods because they are able to be as obscene as that they are able to say we will hand over these things we'll spread them into the prices of goods we are going to cushion ourselves but the poor have got no option to cushion anything on any price of anything they just have to use the meager income and right now i can tell you the collective bargaining is not giving them any increases the the job market is not as dynamic as you would have wanted it to be and also job cre i mean creating creation of jobs is not at the level at which we would have wanted it to be so the poor are always having challenges buckling under pressure carrying the heavy load of price increases of this fuel that goes into the prices of goods and services also that goods i mean your electricity tariffs it's a take it or leave it kind of a thing. Whilst the rich may say, oh, I, I can put up an alternative. <laughs> and some of the middle classes, I will put up some alternative. The poor, the, the poor people don't have that alternative. They have got to regress and go back to go and cutting the wood. If ESCOM would cut them off, they'd become part of those that are in energy poverty. We can't sustain an economy which is having separate development that way. And I want to say to you sitting here, we need to begin to rethink how the poor have suffered in the hands of distributive injustice, where everything is shared amongst the rich, which is good, and the poor only get the, the disadvantaged side of whatever it is that gets implemented. I do now know that gas, um, exploration we are uh, having quite a lot lp gas by the way comes um, as a byproduct of um, your refining process of crude oil and whatnot we are importing just about um 80 percent of crude oil we are importing that and in your refiners the byproduct of that is lp gas and I think it is important to note that most of it is produced locally. But I want to indicate that now it is produced locally, we need to endeavor to make sure that everything that comes into the picture that helps your energy regime, all the people should have access to opportunities and risks. There is something that is called hydrogen that is, is being talked about I met with a certain professor from uh, University of Northwest this week, and he was talking about green hydrogen. And I'm saying, you, do our people even know what green hydrogen is? It is only a few people who know what green hydrogen is. So if you don't know, how do you even get into that business? If you don't know, how do we even partake and participate? It is these things that exclude our people. And it is these things that we need to make sure that they die a natural death. And this um, a presentation that I'm making to you is to whet the appetite for us to know that energy is not as simple as just flicking a switch or worrying about the increases. It is as socially and as economic, but also as political as possible. And we need people at all the spaces playing in policy formulation. We know that policy formulation may start at a certain level and end at parliament. But sometimes, even though there are consultations, the consultations just become very academic, tick box exercises. And whatever that you say and make input of, it is not even considered in the final product production of the document. And nobody even, even sees uh, 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 what was the criticism of the input of the poor people. We have had many, many of those, but it seems like everything comes as if things are foregone. 
it would seem like as long as the international world, the IMF and the World Bank and the Global North has decided, the people here receive it, the businesses and governments uh, take these shared solutions and make them sound like doctrine, sound like religion. You can't oppose it. You can't make input. It is almost like the Bible, which you can't edit. You can't no, add, people are editing, but you can't add anything and subtract anything. It shouldn't work that way. Our people should make input in everything, including uh, what the white people are doing now, saying 11% of a road accident fund levy should be dropped. We should have our own people saying, no, it shouldn't be dropped because of this and that reason. We should also understand why petrol is expensive where we are. We should be able to see that there is 20% of petrol levy that is going into the roads and whatnot. And there is also 11% that is going into the insurance that deals with the after effects of uh, road, road accidents. We need to know that we are moving. We are moving from petroleum driven cars to electricity driven cars, which means petrol attendants must understand and know that their jobs are moving, are, are dying a natural death. There should be a way to make sure that uh, they do not get excluded in the decisions. Is anybody talking to them? My question is, is there anybody including them in debates and hearing from them? Is there even anybody worrying about their skills at a garage level? People who are pouring petrol. As and when petrol won't be poured, what happens to them? As and, as and when the garage closes for a food store, what happens to them when they don't have anything else to do because we've moved to something else? I think let me stop here and um, I know when I talk, I'm a little bit preachy and fast, but it is to try to make sure that at least we cover what just transition is and what it should cover and what is the role of people like us. We have got a role, Chairperson. We have got a role that we need to play. And I am telling you now, there is no one who can say the door is closed. We need to if we doors are not being opened, we need to kick doors because gone are the days when we'll sit and watch and worship the emblems of our political parties and worship even the decisions that do not make sense and worship at a cult level people. And we do not look at the principles of where the things are being driven to. So energy is being driven into a certain space, but are we all up aboard? Uh, the final parting shot is to say it is always dangerous to not be found at a station ready waiting for the bus. It is always dangerous to want to chase the train from behind. We may not catch it. The danger of chasing the bus is we may not get it because the bus would have gone past the station. But right now we are still able. And I want to challenge us after this uh, chairperson, I want us to agree that we will go into places where these decisions are made. Make input. There is no need for us to talk to each other and feel good talking to each other. We must talk to the powers that be and our views should either be rejected or accepted than our views staying in our briefcases. Thank you so much, Chepes. Thank you, Dr. Mbodi. Uh, well articulated and uh, well presented uh, discussion there around uh, energy. Uh, we, we really, really appreciated uh, the enlightenment that you brought forward to us. Uh, um, for those uh, and for the sake of those that would have uh, joined late, let me just uh, quickly do an overview, a uh, summary of uh, what you covered uh, this afternoon, sir. You firstly identified the reserves that uh, we have in terms of uh, oil, in terms of natural gas, in terms of coal, in terms of also the capabilities that are sitting with uh, nuclear power to say, whilst uh, there are people who are concerned with uh, waste storage and those kind of things, as South Africa, we are even far less uh, uh, managing those kind of risks that uh, are being employed out there. You 
you actually spoke to the climate change and its impact to say, in terms of all these changes that we are seeing, and when you made a probable uh, example of the rain that we recently had, to say uh, we, we may ne not necessarily understand that uh, these are the kind of effects of climate change and uh, the, the dire uh, 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 effects downstream of uh, these uh, climate change are talking to food security. They are also talking to water scarcity. And you went uh, uh, a deep dive into the challenges around uh, food security and what it has uh, to the mere man on the street. The challenges that we have in terms of water to the mere man on the street and uh, to a country, which is a third, third world country such as, as, as South Africa, where we needed to already have gotten plans in place and also uh, be in a space where we act towards uh, providing solutions that can sustain these things because these are resources or commodities that are depleting at a high rate and there seems to be nothing that is happening. You, you, you then uh, spoke about ignoring the, the changes that is happening around ourselves, um, you, you did indicate to say it is because of the difference in classes that we have in our society, where some can afford to buy water, some can afford to not even uh, get the, the share of clean water in the environment, but they have dependency of the rivers of this world or the rivers of this country to attain water. You spoke about transition and you indicated quite a lot of things that are happening that should be cognizance that or this that we should be cognizant of and take heed of as the changing uh, or, of, or as the changes that are developing in our space uh, as people living in this uh, global community to say there is a, a quite a drive now of uh, us, uh, or at least uh, the countries uh, uh, moving away from internal combustion uh, type of engines towards uh, electrical uh, 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 vehicle type of uh, 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 engine. And you, you went the extent to indicate the impact around uh, this to say, uh, whilst that is happening, we need to have a strategy as a country to say, what are we doing? in terms of things such as uh, the capacity to these requirements in a country. Um, these are talking to the plugging points for those EV cars that are coming into the space. You're talking about the capacity to support in terms of skills that are required and how it's a downstream uh, impact uh, also needs to be recognized where uh, the mechanics that we have, uh, uh, those that we have done artisan work such as mechanical work for the engines, how they will be impacted. And uh, as you indicated rightfully to say, we need to have a good uh, audit skill, uh, at least to, to, to be in a space where we are not only dependable on the external people to drive this kind of initiative in our country when we've got people with brains in this country. You, you, you want to say there needs to be a serious planning around these things so that the transition is smoother. This entails the engagement of uh, our people. This entails uh, uh, really being genuine in terms of the forward plans for this country, rather than just taking, as you call it, a copy and paste type of scenario without really recognizing um, the, the, the challenges that are existing currently. You went uh, and... Uh, uh, put all of those uh, uh, pointers in their own spaces. You, you spoke about distributed uh, justice, where you were really hammering to say it is important that uh, all the opportunities that are coming with all these technological changes, as well as how energy is now going to be consumed, or at least to be used. That they 
opportunities that are coming. You spoke about uh, uh, the 11% discussion from a certain group that uh, was uh, querying to say the road accident fund must reduce its 11% and it's a discussion that probably some of our colleagues here in the plenary would want to take up. But yes, you, you did highlight that. You spoke about the social policies that should uh, really, really strive to want to bring us uh, uh, closer as a a, a, a country where all the social network uh, uh, protections are really, really put forward. Here you are talking about all these uh, uh, grants that are uh, being given to the people to say, well, that has been uh, done. There needs to also be something that balances all of these things so that we're not just a country that is dependable on social grants, but we also have got a reserve or at least some kind of balancing act that uh, would sustain those uh, uh, grants. You spoke about restorative justice, and I like it because uh, this uh, talks to how uh, manipulative some of the external uh, partners, as well as uh, those that are coming from a far north, uh, would do in our countries or countries or a continent such as Africa, and we've seen it. It is not uh, something that we should be shying away from. You, you are indicating to say there needs to be proper restorative uh, justice in terms of those that are impacted by the technological advancement that are brought into the space. When we are talking about clean air, when we are talking about uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, processes that are being done in those uh, spaces where people are living. You spoke about procedural justice as well to say, it is important that everything is done above board without uh, fear or doubt, so that uh, 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 the engagement, or at least when something such as this is now put towards uh, uh, the rollout of the, the benefit of the country, that people are not questioning to say, how did it happen? Where, where were we? Uh, how, how was this uh, uh, made as a determination for us or on behalf of us when we're not part of it? These are the kind of things that you, you, you flagged and you indicated to say, and I like it, you said the people should design and not be told of uh, what is going to happen. They should be part of the process uh, so, so that at least we have a harmony towards uh, the of uh, whatever technological advancement such as EV that is coming our way. You did indicate the challenges of the down uh, impacts of uh, these kind of changes such as uh, petrol attendance to say, uh, they should be in the knowing that uh, come sooner or later, we will not be filling uh, our cars with uh, gas, but we'll be plugging uh, ourselves uh, uh, from home, or at least there will be those uh, uh, plug-in points where we just uh, have our cars uh, plugged so that they are charged. That, that, that would have been a, a pretty much summation of what you, you tapped on the Tembori. And we thank you ever so much for such uh, an opportunity to enlighten us. Let me then open up and uh, let other colleagues in the space to then raise uh, questions so that at least once we've got time here uh, to further uh, clarify some of the things that we discussed, uh, part of uh, the uh, over uh, summation that I've just given now. Let us uh, open up to uh, the team. Anyone uh, who wants to raise a, a question or a point of clarity? Is there anyone who wants to? Yes, iPhone. You can go ahead, sir. Is that me, leadership? You can go ahead, yes. Oh, OK. My apologies, first of all, for coming uh, in late. Uh, load shedding, ESCOM doing what it's famous for. I have missed 90% uh, of the presentation. I'm not sure if my question is really going to be relevant, um, but what I've missed, I'll go and you've done a summary chair, thank you. 
but I will have to go and listen uh, slowly on the recording. But my question is, I've had parts of the, uh, what do you call the weather, uh, not the weather, the, the, the energy uh, uh, issue, which is I'm very interested in. Uh, but because I've missed it, I would like just to know from the host, uh, uh, first to thank him for coming and sharing his enormous amount of knowledge with the club. I would like to know how is what you are saying, what I had chairperson uh, uh, summarize, how in your opinion is related, if you are aware uh, of uh, the new world order or agenda 2030, which we are walking into uh, eight years towards uh, agenda to uh, the year 2030. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tabakwe, for the question. Um, whilst Mr. Mbodi is still uh, scribbling uh, that particular question, let us uh, see if there's any other further question for clarity in terms of uh, uh, any uh, input so that maybe you can take a whole sum uh, from yourself. Do also look at the, uh, uh, or at least uh, take advantage of the chat box to put your comment if uh, you, you, you do not necessarily want to uh, raise a, a vocal uh, request or at least clarity. That embody, let me give you an opportunity to, to answer that uh, question, sir. You are muted, sir. No, no, I'm sorry about that. Thank you so very much. Um, I didn't get your name, sir, but uh, it is just written iPhone. Um, I, I think I hear the question about New World Order. Sorry, about yeah. Sorry? It's about sorry, sir. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. okay yeah. no, thank you so much, sir. No, look, the New World Order, I, I can't, um, uh, uh, this, I can't say there is no new world order that is being um, uh, thought of. But the one that we, uh, last time I tried to talk about the way in which, it's not far-fetched what you say, because the way in which we are driving economies in different countries, we have got the global North countries that are making us fully indebted, heavily indebted in such a way that even when you have got your own government, that government owes in such a way that they feel that they are proxies of the IMF or the World Bank. They, I mean, governments are not running their governments as it is. The World Bank is telling them, even when they are communists, some of them, they know that there is, uh, we must nationalize these, we must, na they say, no, they go against the very same grain, simply because the global north, it's driving things to a certain direction. In the last installment of my presentation, I indicated that there seems to be a concerted effort to drive the energy to a certain direction. So the arguments that we might have that says, uh, the, it's very, very important to fight with our governments, with the policy makers here to tell them, look, this is our country. This is how we want to go. This is where things should not go to. So now I'm not saying the new world order in this thing, it's, it's not involved. I wouldn't pinpoint it directly and say, I know for sure. But what I know is that there seems to be a direction for the World Bank and the IMF, the global uh, North countries to want to control, to start by controlling countries in the South, countries that are poor, countries that are already owing them enough uh, to, to, to allow neoliberalism in, into their countries. So I know for sure that we are not governing as we want to govern. We are not ruling. Our people are not, those that are in power, they are really not in power. That is, they, that is why they go to Geneva. Why would you go to Geneva to do what in Geneva? Why are they going to that uh, pilgrimage in inverted commas in Geneva? 
That is where people are committing and moving, agreeing to move in a certain direction, which would mean globalization. It starts with globalization that we might end up with a new world order. I don't know if this is a one such trait to move energy into that direction. But having said this, climate change is real. It needs to be addressed. Uh, even though the uh, endeavors by people to can drive new world order uh, issues, we need to guard against that. And we must implement our own way of making sure that climate uh, change um, impacts are addressed by us and with our decisions. And nobody must go and take additional debt without us saying that is what we need. That is how far I can go. I can take this uh, chairperson. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mbodi. And uh, uh, I see there is a network issue. I think it's from, I don't know whether it was me, but uh, the, you were cutting uh, just uh, towards the tail end. Uh, but I think we, 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 we got uh, the gist of uh, your response. Um, I'm not sure as to whether uh, there is any follow up uh, from Mr. Uh, uh, Tabakwe, Mr. Bo. Chair, thank you again. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, leadership board, for your response. Uh, I've got a, I've got a follow-up question. I'm very passionate about the subject that you are presenting. Um, it's a pity that we have really far less people here to acquire this knowledge that you're sharing with us. Uh, my other question, which is just a follow-up uh, on climate change, is. I've read somewhere when I was just walking around that there's a place called Seren. Uh, I'm not sure if you have heard of Seren. C-E-R-N. Seren. It's a place in Switzerland. Uh, okay. This place is, yeah, so this place has been there. Leadership, we, we, we. You are muted, oh. sir. Yo, sorry. Uh, well, well, where did I end? Uh, what did you hear? How far did you hear me, Chair? You, you were still uh, saying uh, there is a, a a a place called Siren in, in okay. uh, Switzerland, yeah. and then you okay. got part of you you were okay. uh, established. Yeah. In... yeah, there's a place called Siren, C E R N. It is in Switzerland that which we have just mentioned now coincidentally. Uh, uh, Seren is set uh, popularly known as a weather manipulation uh, center, which is which is alleged that uh, the power elite uh, uses a, a, a Seren most effectively when they fight for. Uh, controlling the situation to put it under control in, the, in certain countries where they want to acquire forcefully the economy of those countries. So I'm not sure, and, and it, it leads to uh, uh, a lot of people believing that uh, uh, climate change is a hoax because people can manipulate weather. Let me let me cite a simple example, uh, Mr. Uh, Bodhi, if you allow me. If you can allow me to cite a simple example, we will have seven days weather bureau estimation uh, uh, from the weather uh, center people. And it said that information comes from Seren. They are able to tell you how the weather will behave for seven days, for a week, even for a month. So my point is, how do you think that is related to a topic of weather, I mean, uh, climate change? that it's, it's a topic of discussion today. Thank you. Oh. You can go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you so much. Now, look, I am not aware of um, the, I don't have full detail with regards to issues of weather manipulation, but let, let me also, on the other side, I know that Chinese are making artificial rain, so, it works both ways, right? There can be people manipulating so that it can become worse or bad. 
but there are others who are making sure, who are trying to make sure that um, um, there is artificial uh, uh, rain that is created. You must go and check this up. I think the Chinese are doing that. But having said that, I want to indicate that this world is full of many things. Some of them are being faked. Some of them are real. I can assure you in my thoughts, before I started to be an activist on the issues around climate, I had to, to check certain things. And I've checked the place where I grew up. And I have seen just what climate change would have, climate change would have cost. Certain places where there were dams, where I grew up, uh, I, I am of the early 70s. So where I grew up, there used to be a dam. And today where there was a dam, uh, there was now a soccer field. And now I see that the soccer field is now turned into, they've plowed on it, so there are, uh, there is uh, umbila. Now, these are real things that I've seen about drought that is caused in our, my understanding caused by climate change, which is affecting rainfall patterns. Whether they are uh, manufactured or not, I don't have the full benefit of information with regards to that. But I consider the difficulties the people where I grew up are having now, now that the water in rivers have dried up. Even some places that I've gone to, um, that I know of that used to have water. There used to be a river called the Livubu River or uh, Livubu River in uh, Limpopo. Uh, it used to be a very big river with crocodiles and whatnot. And it was, uh, uh, right now it is a shadow of its former self. Uh, where there was a river, you can see there's people are getting only river sand to go and build houses. I'm also seeing that uh, the weather patterns, where it is hot, the heat is going higher, the way it is, I mean, the, the, the seasons are confused as it is. Because when it should rain, it doesn't, it rains when it shouldn't rain. And I, I, that I see. But what I may not have the evidence of is that all that is because of manipulation. I don't write of the fact that they, there may be manipulation at, at, at that place that you are speaking of. Because as it is, I hear that there are people who are making artificial rain. There are also people who are making artificial, artificial uh, beaches. They're making waves and things like that. Those, so things can be faked, I agree. But I don't know, I don't have full evidence that everything that we see of climate change is, uh, is, is, is because of that manipulation. That is my honest view about that. It might be true, but I, I'm not too sure if I have got evidence with regards to that, um, Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mbodi, uh, and uh, uh, thanks, uh, Chair uh, Dr. Uh, Tabakwe. Um, let, let us also just check if there's any other further uh, request or clarity clarity for request uh, from the team. If there isn't, let me let me also throw in um, in terms of uh, what has been. Oh, let me let me first then give uh, Pastor Sabata an opportunity, and then I'll come come at the at the back. Uh, I see also we've got the ten uh, in that order, it will be Pastor uh, Sabata as well as uh, uh, followed by Ntajeng Kosi in terms of the question. You can go ahead, Pastor Sabat. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for the presentation. I just want to make a follow up on this question uh, to say we grew up knowing that there are people who can make the rain uh, and, and the thunderstorms using Bantu science. And we have seen that uh, happening. So it's possible that people uh, can manufacture the, the artificial rain and also manipulate uh, this climate change uh, from, 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 from that experience that I have. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Dr. Sabat. I think it's a comment rather than uh, a question, uh, if, I, if I take it, sir. In, indeed. Thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I also want to thank the Chair, the, the, the presenter, Mr. Mbon, for such a, a sterling job. I think on my side, what I picked up more was the importance of ensuring that we've got the resources and the know-how to able to move with the new technologies or the new uh, direction that the, this sector is, is taking. I think that's partly why such exists to empower, emancipate men to make sure that we are ready for opportunities. And I think uh, the, it is true that there are a lot of things that are going around and it is important that we get the proper information. Hence, we the people like you, um, Mr. Mbodi, are here to give us a different perspective on what we normally get from our media and, and the resources that we use. And I think I just wanted to thank you for that. And I think uh, using myself, I'm getting ready to empower myself in these skill sets that are going to be aligned to what the future uh, is, uh, is, uh, is striving towards. It's, it's certain, the future that is certain. And I think the sooner we accept and align, I think the better. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh, no. Through you, Chairperson. Thank you, sir. Yes, you can go ahead. No, thank you so much, Mfundisi. Uh, Pastor Sabata, thank you so much. Yes. And I must say, even in biblical times, eh, there has been drought in the Bible, and uh, seven years of drought, seven years of abundance. And in the time when there was drought, there was no food. So people had to move from a certain space to a space where there was no drought in order to get food. What we get to see now, other than the making of the rain, the issue of manipulation, is the fact that indeed drought causes that they be food insecurity. And it also talks to water scarcity. And that is a problem that we need to circumvent. Meanwhile, there are people who may be manipulating. We need to find a way to reverse some of these things. If there is anybody who is manipulating, there is a way to make sure that the manipulation doesn't succeed. It is the same as Mfundis. It is the same as demonic things. When demons come to want to manipulate the mind of a person, that issue of delivering, of deliverance, it's 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 a counter manipulation, and so I am saying yes. There is manip if there is manipulation, let's find a way to counter it, and we must agree that drought can cause food shortage, and drought can also talk to difficulty of growing crops and of of, of having livestock and surviving. Siponko uh, uh, what you've just said, it encourages me. I am always, other than the fact that I am um, a commissioner in the climate change, in the presidential climate change, I'm also an activist who on my own right, I do quite a lot of reading. And some of the things that I've got to know today, I have noted them down so that I may take it further. But take it to heart that every technology that gets introduced, if we don't know, if we don't, we have not invented it, if we are not innovative. And I think it is China that doesn't sign this international trade agreement, uh, in, uh, international, this, this property rights. Who go and become innovative and do things, they go and copy and no one can say anything to them. We, but we come here and uh, we don't innovate, we don't invent anything. So in essence, all the technologies get handed down to us and we become uh, 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 users of things that we don't have money to buy. So we borrow uh, money in order to use the technology. This technology is introduced globally, the World Bank, IMF, running with the issues of financing these issues. So at the other end, we don't have the skills, we don't have the technology know-how, we don't have the money, so we keep on begging for everything. They give us money, the technology, and the people with skills, and they come and participate in our economies and rip us off, 
go and take the money and develop their own countries. I think it is time that we begin to question things and make sure that even when these things gets introduced, we say in our terms, if somebody is going to bring something in my house, I say in my terms, this is my house. I've got to make rules for you. You've got rules where you come from, but I am not obliged to take things uh, as they are and swallow them. I have got the ability to take the, 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 the plastic out of the bread and eat the bread. Or I've got an ability to say, I will take two slices. I won't eat the whole loaf. I think that is basically what we should do with the issues of technology. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. I saw a hand and it went down from Mr. Tabakwe there. I don't know, sir, if you still want to raise a question or point of clarity. Yeah, Chair, I was hoping that there will be other hands going up. So maybe I've, I've, I've spoken too much. So maybe I must come again. This is very exciting. I like what Dr. Bodhi is saying. My, I've got two questions based on what he has just said. I think the first question is, uh, you have spoken much about, I think we, I think we, I think we, and you're talking a collective there, and this is very exciting, I love that. My question therefore is, how do we make sure that a, uh, everybody wakes up, it becomes a we? How do we conscientize the whole society to wake everybody up because I look at this very important topic today in this meeting we only have seven people in or eight people or ten people how do we wake up everyone to participate in making those changes that we alluded to uh, I've actually forgotten my second question but yeah that is very important how do we ensure that it becomes a we uh, as a collective the majority of people because in my sense Everybody has got a mobile phone in them. And that's where most information is sitting on the internet and deep down in the rabbit hole. But people are not going there to search for information. You call seminars like the meetings like these ones to come share this information so that we wake up as a collective where people are not attending such. So in your own opinion, how do we collectively make it function as a whole, as a unit, as us to achieve what you say uh, is Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Mr. Tlapakwe. Thank you so much. Uh, look, I, I think that, that question is very important. When you talk climate and energy issues, I will just make a practical example. I want to invite you, I will get the date of the Presidential Commission, which is dealing with energy and climate change. That meeting is open. Maybe you might not be able to raise an, a hand but we will see how debates get, how the engagements goes on. And whenever there are invites of, of meetings other than that, that is supplementing that meeting, we need to be part of that. We must invite ourselves. I am saying this deliberately. This club that I am presenting at, I am going to make sure that there is somebody here who will attend and also understand what is going, what are the processes that are being followed? Because this meeting is open. The, the people of this world are watching this, but South Africans are not. I have checked the stats of people watching the presidential commission where all the ministers and activists and people like myself are partaking. I have seen the trend that the people do not seem to know or people do not see in, have interest. So when I look at the people who watch, it is activists and academia engineers and whatnot. So which exclude a huge mass of our people who should know not because they want to be educated, who should know because this affect and impact that day-to-day -day living. So I think the first thing is to practicalize this. Make sure that you invite yourself and be part of the discussions. It starts with an individual having the desire to go and ask and get answers. But it also starts with an individual having a quest for knowledge and thirst and hunger for knowledge such that meetings that are not attended by many. You see, if you post a post like I've posted, you know, I post a lot of things on Facebook and Twitter. But if I post a joke, 
I can tell you there will be a lot of audience there. But if I say we are talking climate change and, and energy issues, people say, ah, we already know load shedding and that's enough. So we need not to put a cap to what we should know. Abam Shope, they've done this, the we thing in a very big way in that they, when their people do not have education, they pull them and make sure that they educate them their way. They mobilize each other. Let's mobilize each other so that we become part of that we. And the other thing that I'm going to say is controversial, but I'm going to say it. We need to take power away from politicians and make decisions and, and reinforce them on politicians. The other way around doesn't work. We've got a whole lot of things that are going wrong because we simply believe that politicians, they've got the total know-how of, of, of the things. Unfortunately, they don't have the know-how of all things. That's why you find one politician having about uh, 40 advisors. Why would they have 40 advisors? They don't know. So we need to be able to mobilize ourselves and say, do we have people in our society who are interested in knowing about climate and energy issues? Form ourselves into a group, even a group out of this gentleman club, and we sit down and say, I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of information on my laptop, which if I die, I will die with that on the laptop without anyone knowing. So one such drive is to mobilize and make sure that you know the basic concepts about this and follow it through. Even the things that are myth and some things that are reality, you will be able to learn and go deeper on them and not just have a shallow knowledge of the subject. So I think the we is to make sure that the poor get communicated in the language they can understand. When I prepared this lecture, you know what I did? I, 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 I broke down certain um, concepts to make sure that they are understandable. I didn't bring about scientific things, technical things. I didn't even bring uh, pure uh, uh, economic science here. I was talking a language that can easily mobilize and make people understand as it is written in the good book that the people who had one language and usage of the same words, uh, they could build the Tower of Babylon. I think the we uh, talks to the language that we use on this information and also the words that we use. And lastly, it's to declassify these serious subjects, to move away from eliticism, from scientists, to move away from academia and politicians and, and financiers to come to us who are affected. That we will work when we begin to kick doors and say, who are you guys deciding for us? We want to make input. I think that is how far the we part we can take it. The poor people need to be part. We need to in, involve them and not only involve them so that they just become part of meetings. We need to have proof that we've taken their advice and we are implementing certain things that the poor people are saying. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Mbodi. Well uh, answered uh, uh, summation there. Um, I wanted to ask a question, but I see the time is also quite uh, nippy now. We only got two minutes to go. Oh. Maybe let me just throw it so that you can quickly uh, uh, throw it back to me and then we, we close. Uh, in terms of what we've discussed as uh, challenges in the country, uh, when we talk energy capacity, when we talk water scarcity and uh, its impact towards uh, food security. What is your assessment in terms of uh, the plans as a person that is close uh, when you, you use your climate uh, uh, commission space uh, towards the, the work that you do? No, I, I, I can see that there is a whole lot of things that are happening. One, the issue of food gardens, um, the issues of water security, the issue of all these things are a cycle which the people need to begin. I think one of the things that we do, we use a lot of water to plant grass. I think 
we should also change and make sure that we plant certain things that are edible that we can eat. I know we love flowers, but we are not white people. We White people can plant flowers, but they know they've got farms, but we don't have land. So we must use land effectively. So I think in the micro level, we should begin to change how we do things and how, what we plant and why we plant certain things. And we should also conserve water. Gone are the days when we'll use all the water that we can use to just wash the car. We need to change some, if we can and where we can, we need to use some pipes that saves water and things like that. Need to report some water leakages because that is water that is being lost out of the system. And I think we are very far. We are very far, Chairperson, in so far as making sure that the people understand that all of us have got a role to play in our little way to avert disaster because disaster is at our doorsteps in terms of water. If Tequini is water uh, 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 scarce, it's water rationing, and uh, the two other places that are next to the sea, PE and uh, East London, are water rationing. I wonder what will happen to us in the long run if we do not begin to save uh, water. What will happen, happen to us when drought hit us? What will happen to food, food security? Uh, let's save water. I know we can water our grass where we can if we've got bowls, but let's also plant water gardens. There is another thing that I've just seen here. Um, I, I want to also add an answer to it. The mainstream education is not talking to the demand of su and supply of skills. Actually, we go and get educated, but we are not matching the needs of the economy. So you might be having a university which is full of HR students who don't know where they're going to practice those skills instead of having skills that are technical, that are needed and desired according to the sector skills plan, according to national skills and development strategy which people should go and read. The National Skills and Development Strategy says what are skills that are critical for the economy. And then we can direct the skills at the right place. So it is, it is a problem. The world will show us the things that we need to implement, knowing very well that we don't have the skills. So they keep their own unemployment at acceptable levels by sending people to us who they have rejected in that, that side, they come to this side and get opportunities that are supposed to be ours. Because we are not matching our education with the skills that the economy need. We've got set of skills that are not needed. We know how to play rugby, but this is a soccer game. So we have got a, a, a square peg in a round hole. Thank, Thank you, so much, Dr. Mbodi and sir. Thank you for the honor to have uh, enlightened us. Uh, we appreciated the time and the effort uh, that you made available uh, to yourself so that uh, we, we can have this uh, engagement. We hope and uh, still uh, will be on the lookout for those invitation. We really would want to take the opportunity to be part of uh, uh, making advances at least for those that uh, have not heard or at least realize the importance of uh, such engagement, engagement for the better of others. Uh, um, we, 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 we are really excited in terms of uh, that opportunity also uh, coming our way as Saljak. Let me also thank uh, each and everyone that has uh, joined and is here uh, for the privilege of also sitting with us this uh, afternoon. Uh, and having uh, uh, engaged or at least a listen over uh, the engagement that we had uh, over this uh, topic called energy in transition. Um, we are going to wrap it up here. Uh, I can only wish you everything of the best and uh, uh, stay safe and God bless you all. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. And I'm Thank available you, whenever you need me. I'm available. Those who need my details, you can share with them, uh, Chair. Yes, I will do but so. But I'm available to even attend other lectures, to attend and listen to other people. And do uh, so. I can and contribute at other network. stages. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ndrovu. Uh, we, 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 we recognize the apology and uh, do take advantage of uh, the recordings that will be uploaded on our uh, uh, post uh, Facebook as well as YouTube 
uh, indeed uh, you will you will find this very interesting thank you ever so much uh, god bless thank you gentlemen thank you so much thank you ma'am i just have to leave i've just lost my power but um i'm hoping to get the link via our subject our whatsapp group yes we'll do that we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll post it there as well all right thank you so much thank you so much bye